Hello and good morning. My audio is finally on. Welcome, everyone. My name is Alicia Luaras Maldonado. Really excited to be with you all this morning. Uh, I'm based here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm a consultant at the Building Movement Project. Really honored to have uh, everyone uh, here with us in the room this morning. I'm seeing folks coming in from Taos, um, Community Against Violence. I'm seeing uh, New Mexico Women's Reentry Center from Albuquerque, New Mexico Arts, um, Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless. Welcome, welcome um, everyone. Very happy to be with you. Uh, continue dropping your name and your information into the chat. Uh, it's really great to be with you all this morning. Um, today, we're presenting one year later, New Mexico, COVID-19, and leaders of color. And before we uh, do that, I really wanted to just take a moment to uh, acknowledge uh, where we are today, um, based here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We want to honor the ancestral indigenous land that we are on uh, and recognize uh, our Tiwa relatives and ancestors whose land that we are on, uh, the elders and the people that still live here. Uh, and so I know that folks are joining us from various parts of New Mexico and even nationally, uh, but want to take a moment to recognize uh, where I am um, in this moment. Catherine, should we go ahead and, and move through and I'll do some housekeeping. So for our webinar this morning, uh, attendees are not visible. Uh, please, again, use the chat to send your questions to the panelists uh, and tech issues to our BNP admin. I want to uh, recognize Catherine Foley with the Building Movement Project, who's been instrumental in helping us to uh, produce this webinar this morning. Um, so thank you again, Catherine, for that. Um, the webinar is being recorded, and we will share the link along with additional materials. Um, throughout uh, today's uh, webinar and even after, if you can tweet POC nonprofits and on the front lines, we would appreciate it. Helps us to get more traffic to our website and uh, for folks to be able to take a look at the report um, on the front lines. So thank you for that. So again, what we're going to do today is we're going to review some of the data and findings of on the front lines, uh, which was a report that uh, came out last year. I uh, was really honored to have some of the panelists that are joining us today uh, for a discussion last fall. And so we've invited some of them back along with uh, an additional guest for a discussion. Uh, after that, we'll open it up um, for some, some Q&A. <clears throat> so this morning, I'm really honored to present our panelists. We have with us Johanna Bencomo, who's the Executive Director of New Mexico Cafe down in Southern New Mexico. We have Angel Charlie, the executive director of the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women, uh, based here in Albuquerque. We have Sachi Watase, executive director of the New Mexico Asian Family Center, and Henry Brutus, the executive director of La Casa Inc., also down in southern New Mexico. So really uh, grateful to all of you for taking the time to join us this morning to share your thoughts and your perspectives. Um, and I also want to acknowledge all of the attendees this morning uh, for joining us um, and taking the time to share uh, your thoughts and perspectives. Again, please continue to drop your questions and comments and chats into the um, into our chat. It's open. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Building Movement Project, but before I did that, I wanted to recognize I, uh, the Building Movement Project team members who are on the call today. Uh, as far as I know, I want to recognize uh, the co-directors of Building Movement Project, uh, Francis Conrider and Sean Thomas Breitfeld, who I've had the privilege of working with for several years. Uh, they're based in New York. Uh, Olivia Pena and Leah Steimel are also our other team members that do work uh, with us here in New Mexico. And um, so just, just want to welcome uh, them and acknowledge the work that they do on behalf of Building Movement Project. Building Movement Project is a national organization that really does work around systems change, leadership development, and working for social change. Uh, particularly in New Mexico, we have done that through 
uh, the Common Good Action Project work, where we do um, direct one-on-one cohort work with uh, direct service uh, organizations and, and nonprofits. We uh, do that work also through the release of uh, surveys and reports, uh, like the one that we're talking about today on the front lines. Um, and so really honored to, to be doing this work with Building Movement Project. Uh, you can go to buildingmovementproject.org uh, for more information on the work that Building Movement Project does nationally and here in New Mexico. So again, the On the Front Lines report is a 2020 report from the Building Movement Project and Solidarity is uh, collected data from over 400 nonprofit leaders of color. Um, so today we'll be looking at some of the key findings. Um, there were testimonials and quotes, and there were recommendations for philanthropy, nonprofits, and the government in this report. Uh, it's available for download. If you go to bit.ly backslash COVID POC, you can download, uh, download that report. So last year, when we started to shut down right after, um, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and it, it's been a year, right? And it's been an extremely tough year for, for many folks, right? A, a great loss of life, shifts in work, um, loss of funding, uh, incredible challenges. Uh, and now we're moving into a year later and, and dealing with, um, you know, vaccination rollout, how folks are going to get back to work, mental health issues. But at the onset of that, uh, Deepa Ayer, who's the author of the report uh, and was instrumental in doing this, presented some learning questions uh, from on the front line. And so these were the questions that were at the forefront of, of doing the initial survey. And then even all these years later, uh, reflecting back on, you know, how COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted communities of color. How are POC nonprofits responding? Um, what do they anticipate over the next three to six months? How did the 2020 uprisings affect POC nonprofits? Um, what's the current environment and what changes must be made in order to rebuild a different future? So these were the learning questions from on the front lines. And so today we'll be digging into these questions a little bit more with our panelists. Um, again, please feel free to, to pose your questions uh, and um, the opportunities and challenges that you all um, are bringing with us, um, bringing with you as panelists. So what, you know, what we found through the survey, through this last year, through the stories that have been lifted up to the people that we have spoken with, uh, Black, Indigenous, and Latino communities are three times more likely to contract COVID-19 and twice as likely to die from it as white people. Black, Asian, and Latino communities are contending with the worst of the economic crisis, high rates of unemployment, housing instability. And even at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw that Latino, Black, and Indigenous communities were already food insecure at the start of the pandemic. So what we found from this report was that the crisis is about to get worse. Nonprofits are having to make up for government inefficiencies. The climate is taking an immense toll on people of color leaders, particularly women of color. Long-term financial stability of POC-led nonprofits are at stake, and it's time for systemic change and solidarity. Anticipated community needs that we found from the report uh, remain the same as they did last year. Um, it was very clear that these issues would continue to grow, particularly um, as we were waiting for relief packages. And we'll, we'll talk with our panelists today about what the current relief package means for them and for their communities. Um, but really looking at uh, cultural and linguistical needs, uh, the digital uh, literacy, surges illnesses, um, what's happening with voter disenfranchisement, uh, and really looking at um, the, the big picture of uh, anticipated community needs and what sorts, uh, sorts of systemic change uh, we're going to need in our communities. I wanted to share a quote um, from 
from the report um, that really speaks to the desire to engage in solidarity from non-Black uh, folks to engage in political education, strategy development, and generative conversations with other leaders of color. And so as we think about um, how we do anti-Black racism work, anti-Asian American work, um, supporting indigenous values and relationships, uh, really looking at how we are standing in solidarity with each other. And we'll get into that in our discussion here in a little bit. This moment is calling for us to center African-Americans. That path is not yet clear to me. We need to deepen our analysis. And so this is something that we wanna lift up for all of us as we think about how we move forward in solidarity with each other. So where do we go from here? The next few slides will talk about the systemic and policy changes and the recommendations that we are putting forth. Um, access to basic services, universal health care, uh, access to technology and education are things that we really need to look at. The next slide uh, shows some recommendations in philanthropy that we want to lift up. followed by recommendations for the nonprofit sector, looking at cultures of well-being, the current climate, uh, and really leaning into the knowledge and experiences of our POC leaders. So I wanna move us into uh, a short, uh, well, we have one more slide that I think is really uh, indicative of where we are now, right? Um, having to be flexible, uh, moving through the challenges, um, that we are all facing together. Before we move into the panel discussion with our uh, panelists, I know that Catherine has a poll that we wanted to uh, present to those of you who are with us today. And I think we've got that set up. So what are your most pressing concerns right now? And we'll move that up for a couple of minutes so that you can um, respond to it. Okay, I think we are getting some responses. And yes, thank you for that. The slides will be made available um, after this webinar and the findings and recommendations can be found on our website. So that's in the chat as well. So we are sharing the poll results. Uh, of the pressing concerns right now. And it looks like mental health problems and trauma is the leading one followed by access to the vaccination and food and housing instability. So again, those findings that um, were part of last year's report, we're showing that those are still very much on the front of people's thoughts. So thank you for sharing. I wanna go ahead and open it up to, um, to our panelists and, and welcome and thank Johanna and Angel, Sachi and Henry, once again, for taking the time to join us this morning. Really appreciate all of you uh, being here with us. So, so thank you once again. I wanted to go ahead and start with our first question that really looks at what has shifted in how you do your work. Um, what, what have you had to do differently in terms of new programs or uh, added changes that you have had to do? And, and maybe Sachi, if you want to go ahead and get us started on this first question. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so for our organization, I think we've had to really adjust to the technological needs of our clients because many of them don't have access to certain types of technology to connect with the resources they're needing. And so um, we've had to be that liaison that really um, because we can't go in person to, to provide the services, we have to do everything remotely and that causes so many other access issues and language barrier issues that um, have really 
skyrocketed since the pandemic started, in addition to the incredibly high rate of clients that we've also been seeing. And so while we have more clients, we also have it, every client takes a little bit more time because we're also, you know, having to find all of these different ways to get them to the resources through new ways and help them understand the different um, tech <laughs> issues and phone calls that we have to do. And, and I think that's been big. And then also communicating with our communities has been really challenging because, um, again, many of them don't have access to broadband or to um, smartphones necessarily. And so um, we've also been, you know, trying to create, have creative ways of getting to them. And we've been creating little video in language videos um, throughout this past year to send information about the, the pandemic. And even that is not perfect, right? Like not many of them, I can't access that, but um, just trying to find different ways for people to get access to information because um, our, most of the places in this state don't actually provide that language access and that culturally specific um, approach for um, the particular population that we serve. Mm -hmm. Johanna, do you want to share as well in terms of what you all are doing with down in, in uh, southern New Mexico? What is what has shifted and how you're doing your work a year later? Thank you. Um, thanks for having us again. Um, it's great to be here with all of my colleagues um, one more time. Um, it's also just really good to process out loud some of these things. Um, yeah, so, you know, we are uh, community organizers. It's not in our nature to do um, virtual um, transformative relationship building. And so it's been a really difficult adjustment, honestly, for our staff and for the members of our base as well, as well, our leaders. They're used to seeing us in their living rooms, in their churches, in their communities. And that's been really um, difficult. I will also say that, um, you know, it's been, it's, you know, we work in Doñana County, across Doñana County, Luna County, Hidalgo mm -hmm. County, and Grant County, many communities that don't have access to reliable internet and broadband. And so it's been really difficult to actually have very good conversations with people, even through Zoom. Um, so that's been honestly really difficult. And, you know, Alicia, something you said earlier about nonprofits really having to pick up the slack where government has failed. That has really been true. And even for us who do a lot more macro systemic policy work, we've really been um, on the front lines of pushing government to do better, to do better for people who've been excluded, like immigrant families. And um, it's been, you know, right now we're, in, we're like what, four days from the legislature ending. So on top of all our, you know, regular advocacy work, we've had to layer on economic relief and fighting for what feels like often crumbs for families to, to be able to just survive one more week. Um, and so that's been honestly really heavy. Um, and I say that right with this, um, acknowledging my privilege in that I get to work from home. Sorry about that. Um, I get to work from home with my dog barking and it doesn't matter, right? I'm still able to do that. And a lot of other people haven't either have lost their jobs completely or have to risk their lives every day at work and their health and, and the health of their family. And so I very much acknowledge that and, and um, which I don't know, it has given me a lot more ganas, like a lot more energy to, um, to push government to do better by our people, but it's definitely been, um, it's taken a toll for sure. Angel, what, what has shifted for you all? And I wanted to um, also have you think about, you know, we, the relief package was just approved, right? And so there's now, folks are now getting their, their uh, stimulus monies and there's, there's, you know, money now going into the communities. Um, what does that mean for the organizations and communities? What does that look like? Thanks, Alicia. Good morning, everybody. Gawatsi Hopa. Um, the work that shifted, so I'll answer kind of that piece first for us. Um, I think I'd like to just pick up where Johanna set it down, which is like, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I've, there's been so many times we've had decision fatigue over the last year. I'm just tired of making decisions and tired of um, responding. Like we don't get to take, this isn't a nine to five Monday through Friday for us. This is, um, we live our missions. Um, we are the populations we serve, a lot of us. Um, 
so some of the ways that we've shifted is um, we've made permanent our food security programming um, through our native youth um, outreach. And so um, now we've committed to food security or sovereignty as violence prevention. We continue to provide PPE and um, you'd be surprised at how often we're doing it every single month, still providing those basic necessities to communities. Um, and then I think the biggest, one of the biggest changes um, is building in rest. So for the reason that I started off with, we're really being intentional about um, resting and needing to create boundaries for ourselves, um, you know, as we work through the movement. And then the stimulus package, um, one of the provisions that we're really interested in is how much of that money is going to be earmarked for tribal communities and tribal governments. And this last go round, New Mexico was one of maybe two, I wanna say, states that had earmarked um, federal monies to, to get to tribal communities. So that's not happening throughout the country. Um, and we're fortunate that we live in a state that prioritizes community, uh, tribal communities, tribal governments, um, but that's not the case everywhere. Um, yeah. What about you, Henry? What in this past year, what has shifted for your organization and um, have there been um, new ways of thinking, new solutions to, to challenges that have uh, risen? And then also thinking about like the new COVID relief package and what that means for the work that you all do down in Southern New Mexico. Good morning, Alicia, and good morning, everyone. Um, great question. So in addition to what my colleagues stated, and I think they said it very well, I think in terms of new decisions or solutions, it's every single day, right? Because every day it's different. We're not sure what we're logging into. So um, we're having to make those decisions many times on the fly. Um, one of the elements for me that's been really challenging. So yes, it's challenging to, to connect um, clients with services in these days, especially we serve a largely a lot of our area that we serve is rural, which means they don't have internet connectivity, et cetera, or it's very patchy. So um, trying to do that remotely is challenging itself. But I think also in the work that we do, we deal with human connection. So being disconnected, because even here, like behind the screen, we're not together. I mean, I'd love to have been around a table somewhere with my colleagues and we're, we're chit-chatting versus being here behind a screen. So um, that connection has lacked, and I, I like to say that it takes at least, and I think I speak for all of us, um, in our work, it takes people to do the work. We're not, you know, we can't rely on AI or, or anything like that. So not having these connections, you know, to make us well, then we're expected to make others well. And in addition, so the other side of this has been, we've seen you know, I work mostly in DV and domestic violence. Um, the severity of cases has has been worse than I had seen in in a few years before. Um, the number of cases also, I mean, it comes in waves. So there may be no hotline calls today, and then tomorrow there are like a thousand. So it just it just, I mean, I, I'm I'm so fortunate. I'll just give a a quick plug in for my for those that I work with, my employees, as well as partner organizations, because it really demonstrates during this time, and we talk a lot about the resiliency of the nonprofit sector, but it really speaks to resiliency of each person to be able to still be here a year later and still doing this work and doing it well. I think that speaks volumes. Um, in terms of the stimulus package, the latest one, um, I, Unfortunately, I don't know all the specifics yet. So I'm really happy that we're getting funding into, into people's hands, especially those that may need it the most, those that lost their, their employment or, or, or are struggling to you know, pay their rent or mortgage, et cetera. I just wish we would have something that's more sustainable because I think of the one piece of it that I know about is you know, several persons within certain income brackets are gonna get $1,400 how far can that go, 
is that a month, is that two months? And then what happens after that? So, and then if you were behind the last six months, are you just getting caught up? So then what happens tomorrow? You know, the first will come again before we know it. So I just wish um, we would think of more, more long-term solutions versus just a, you know, just a quick bell out, if you will. But I'm, I'm happy for the most part. I mean, at least it's something versus nothing, but I just wish we, you know, we'd have the, the end game in mind versus just today. I think that's really important what you lift up, Henry. And, you know, I think to, you know, what uh, Johanna uh, referenced earlier, you know, the nonprofits are really having to do a lot of the heavy lifting right now um, for their communities. And so as we think about, you know, what could um, th the government be doing um, to help, right, folks really address the deep need. And I'm curious um, for you all, you know, given the great need and the demand uh, for services, have have new coalitions formed or new partnerships within your work that you might not normally have, um, you know, considered uh, before COVID-19? And, and what have those looked like if that has been the case? Maybe Sachi, if you want to start or, jo sorry, Johanna, I saw you about to, about to go, so go for it. I just want to jump in to get rid of the silence. <laughs> um, yes, but I can jump in. I am, um, you know, I, I don't know if it, there's been necessarily any new ones where I didn't ever imagine, but the, the partners that we'd worked with in the past on a number of issues, workers' rights, immigrant rights, um, honestly, we are in meetings every week um, talking about how, how are we going to respond to this? How are we going to push for that? How are we? Um, and I mean, honestly, it's been since March, we've been meeting on a weekly basis um, with coalition partners like Somos Un Pueblo Unido, El Centro de Igualdad y Derechos, New Mexico Voices for Children, Partnership for Community Action. Like we've really sort of come together to figure out how will we respond together and push our local governments or state governments to really show up for immigrant families, for undocumented folks who, you know, you know, um, the American Rescue Plan, thankfully this year, this time around was a lot more inclusive than last plan that really excluded a lot of undocumented folks. It even excluded spouses and um, of ITIN filers It excluded US born children who had undocumented parents. Um, it left out a lot of people and this time around it um, it was a lot more inclusive. Don't get me wrong. There's still a lot of undocumented folks that got left out of relief, but it was more inclusive. And, um, you know, we're also just trying to, at the state wide level, how do we, how do we push for, for, um, for better policies that protect every single New Mexican, regardless of income level, regardless of immigration status. And um, I've been honestly deeply, deeply thankful for those partners who we've just grown in our um, our relationship with each other um, and, you know, and, and then, you know, we're currently fighting for a statewide pay sick leave bill and that coalition has been really broad and really beautiful. And I think partly because of the pandemic, um, it was able to expand that widely, um, people recognizing how intersectional that work is. And um, so, I, you know, I, in many ways, it's made me just love the nonprofit sector even more, especially here in our state, I think. We've been doing incredible jobs. Sachi, what about you all in, in your work um, with the New Mexico Asian Family Center? Yeah, um, so full disclosure, I'm a pretty new executive director. I started back in um, September. So I started in the middle of the pandemic, so I, I don't have necessarily a comparison from before, but I would echo what Johanna said that I know that many of the many of the coalitions we're a part of have been meeting more often. Um, we meet weekly with a lot of them. And also, um, yeah, we because our, we serve a very large, or it's a small population in comparison in New Mexico, but it's it's very wide, it's spread out and it's disc it's in many ways disconnected from each other. And so we have a lot of different really specific coalitions like the Sexual Assault Coalition. And then we have like immigrants rights meetings that we attend and we have refugee rights meetings that we attend. And um, it, it just, it spreads out because there's, there's not, um, 
you know, we're asked to do a lot of different things as, as one small organization and fill a lot of different gaps um, in, in different resources that should be available from the state side or um, from the government. So yeah, we have a lot of coalitions, I would say many, many coalitions and we're attending so many meetings every week as well. And I think because, because of um, the working from home format, it, it is nice because you know then we can we can gather with folks from other places in the state in a way that we may not have been able to before. But um, it also means that we can meet more. We can have back to back meetings with like one minute in between, and and that that also is really draining. And and it kind of um, is put on on all of us to to really be there constantly and and be advocating um, with our community partners and be. Um, you know, sharing resources constantly with each other on Zoom. And um, yeah, it, it's a different, different kind of communication that we have had to adjust to and, and a very constant communication, which is important, but exhausting. Mm -hmm. Anything, Angel or Charlie, that you all want to share in terms of, you know, uh, new solutions or coalitions that, um, that have evolved as a, a result of, of dealing with the existing challenges? Yeah, I wanna name two things that we saw and I think we'll continue to see, which is um, the mutual aid efforts that happened over the past year. I think a lot of us got involved with those and those might not necessarily been the way we were meeting community where they were, um, but we've been heavily involved in different mutual aid efforts. <laughs> we show up one time with like 300 gallons of bleach. <laughs> which is like something we had never done before. Um, and then thinking about new coalitions or solutions, um, it feels really good to share and say um, that tribal communities are really leading a lot of the relief efforts. Um, so if you're in proximity to a tribal community, chances are um, they've offered vaccination up to your community, opened their vaccination infrastructure up to your community. Um, and I think that's a new way that we're seeing um, so it, it's all the more reason to get behind communities of color, right? We are constantly thinking um, in like positive ways for our communities, um, really like living out being a good relative. You know, um, I actually wanted to shift ahead to, to something you just lifted up, Angel, you know, and we think about the enormous impact of COVID on communities of color um, and the challenges that exist in terms of accessing resources, right? And so you're, you know, really leaning into mutual aid, uh, into tribal communities, into coalitions that are being formed um, because of either lack of funding or lack of support from the government. And so, uh, you know, even here in New Mexico, we're seeing that, um, you know, some businesses are telling folks to, to go to Texas or other places to get vaccinated. Um, there's an uphill battle within the, the immigrant population around vaccinations. Um, looking at the increase in violence against um, our Asian American communities and, and even what we've seen here in uh, Albuquerque and New Mexico. And so I wanted to shift to talk a little bit about the impacts um, of COVID-19 on um, our communities of color and what your organizations um, are dealing with and, and having to address. And so I thought maybe uh, Henry and Johanna, you could talk about in Southern New Mexico, what you're seeing in terms of the vaccination efforts, in terms of uh, language access and ability to, to uh, access resources. Joanna, I'll, ca I'll count on you, we can tag team. I think the one thing I can contribute is I just recently, I was on a call, uh, I was smiling at Sashi when she was speaking because boundaries don't seem to exist anymore because people expect everything right then and there because they think you're at home. <laughs> um, but I sat in a conference with the Department of Health recently, the New Mexico Department of Health. And then a slide during that conference really stuck out at me. Um, it showed um, vaccination by county. It also showed um, vaccination by, by ethnicities or races. And again, we're still having a challenge in the state where the, the Black and Hispanic population, or Latino population, is still being vaccinated at a much lesser rate than, than others. So um, 
I, you know, I was assured that there are some messages that will be coming out to target these communities. I have not heard or seen them yet. Uh, you know, again, I think when we, you know, when this pandemic started and we started, you know, talking about a vaccine, there were a lot of talks, at least nationally, about, you know, communities of color or people of color not being as trusting as as others. And there are many reasons for that. History history tells us a lot of that. So I think it's a miss that while we knew the vaccine was going to be rolled out, that we didn't have these messages already prepared to go out and the effort and outreach efforts done in these communities to make sure that once the vaccine's available, that people are, you know, we've already dispelled those myths so that people could be in line to be vaccinated or register to be vaccinated. Joanna, I'll turn it to you. <laughs> No, that's right on, Henry. Just yesterday, I was looking at the dashboard um, on the New Mexico uh, Department of Health website, and um, disproportionately, Latinx folks in New Mexico are getting COVID, and they're, I think, at 11% vaccinated vaccination rate. Incredibly low, um, not even as low as Black New Mexicans, though. They have the lowest rate of vaccination in the state, and I just feel like um, I, I mean, Henry's right. I think we could have done a lot more to be prepared for this moment. And then being in Southern New Mexico, we've had some of our elected, local elected officials really pushing for vaccine equity. It's been, um, it's, Doñana County has in fact been getting a lot less vaccines than the rest of the, the state and not just Doñana County, but a lot of Southern New Mexico counties. And um, it's been, it's, Honestly, it's been, it, it has felt like a struggle to, to, to get that sort of equity for a lot of our communities. And to be honest with you, I'm hearing a lot of, um, you know, like people of color are hesitant, immigrants are hesitant. The reality, I don't, it is my experience that they are not hesitant. It's just that they don't have enough information in Spanish. The tool perhaps is complicated to use. It's not accessible for people. It's not that people don't want to take it. It's that I don't know where to go. There is not enough information for me to be able to access those resources. So we're really trying to work with our partners and the Department of Health to bring um, Spanish town halls, virtual town halls to our communities from trusted partners like nonprofits, right? And often DOH will not be a trusted um, uh, partner in a community because people have felt like, I don't know, maybe you don't really care about us, which we all know that's not true, right? But I think in communities, there's this overwhelming sense that that's true. Um, but nonprofits like ours are very much trusted names in our communities and, and um, government entities should rely on us. They should come to us and, and sort of ask us about how we can get more information out. And I hope that we can continue to do that because it's really the only way that we're gonna get back to any sense of normalcy. It's the only way that we're gonna you know, get folks back on track and, and um, it's really worth it, so. Sachi, I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about, you know, dealing with um, what we're seeing in terms of, of, you know, what Johanna and Henry just talked about in terms of access to resources, right, and the language barriers. But in addition to that, the xenophobia and the rise in, in anti-Asian American violence. Um, we, you know, there was an article in the journal just a few months ago with uh, members of your organization talking about what they're facing and, you know, how that impacts um, people's ability to access resources, their ability to be open to vaccinations, to be able to be in community, uh, and, and what you all are dealing with and seeing um, within the community here. Yeah, so um, I, I, would, I would just really echo again what Johanna was saying about the access needs. I mean, we just, it, it's, it's not in language. I mean, they have it they have the translation in Vietnamese and in Spanish, I believe, on the on the um, website, but that's it. And even that is like not really easy to um, navigate. And if people don't know how to do that or don't have access to um, a smartphone or, or laptop to do that, um, it's not easy and it's not easy to navigate or know how to answer those questions. And, um, and then, of course, all the other languages that are represented in this state aren't represented on that on those forms. Um, but we have had folks from the Department of Health reach out to us and um, we've been in conversation with our partner, the Asian American Association of New Mexico to also kind of think about ways that we can reach out to our community 
in a different way or, or to really help them get access to these resources. But it's still, um, I mean, I think what Henry said is really interesting that it's like, why didn't we have this prepared beforehand? Why weren't we ready? We knew this was going on. Um, why aren't we ready? And yeah, and really be able to get access to these communities. Um, and then in terms of the anti-Asian violence, I think it's it's really important to note too that this violence has existed. It's It has existed far before the pandemic. And I think people just, um, you know, started to pay attention more and it became more mainstream and shared on social media. And that's why the, like we say, there's, you know, a lot of people um, are talking about it more, but this has been going on beforehand and, and in our state as well. And we've seen our, you know, our clients come to us with these stories and, um, and I also think that there's there's definitely some cultural um, pieces to it too, that like it's, it's sometimes there's a lot of taboo around um, coming forward for help and um, and sharing these situations and, and it can bring shame to people and their families. And so oftentimes we don't have people coming forward about these situations. And, and I think, um, yeah, and I, I also think that it's also a huge result of the model minority myth, which is that, you know, the Asian community is doing great and everything's fine. And um, and it's just, it, it really leaves out so much of the reality that's going on. And, um, and yeah, this has been going on for a very long time and it's only becoming mainstream now with, with this, um, you know, what we say, like the rise in anti-Asian violence. And of course it has been really, deeply disturbing and saddening to watch these videos and um, see what's going on and very traumatizing for many people. And um, and it's also not unexpected in some ways, you know, this is all just a result of white supremacy and the way that, um, you know, the same kind of ideas hurt all of these communities in different ways. And I think for our communities, it's like, how do we um, create spaces that are safe and places that they can go and um, share these stories and um, be heard and believed and um, and then what can we do you know it's, it's hard to know all of this like what you know we do a lot of case management and so we support folks in getting um, different aid that they are seeking but um, we don't really have a system in place in New Mexico um, to really collect these stories. And we we're actually talking recently with the Asian American Association about thinking of ways to collect this information and, and really um, it, within New Mexico, um, that's, you know, that's been happening ongoing for years and, and um, even more so now. So yeah, and then I, I guess that it all comes, it's all compounded and, and makes it of course harder to access resources or seek help um, when of course we're also in the middle of a pandemic and families are being deeply affected by that, losing their jobs, um, not being able to pay rent, like maybe the least of their worries is coming to us to talk about, you know, a hate crime that happened when they are trying to get food on the table. And so um, I think that there's there's just so many compounded issues here that, that are really affecting um, our communities and we see that every day. Thank you for sharing that, Sachi. And I think that you you do lift up that tension that exists in terms of like the deep need uh, in the communities, right? And so folks are having to choose like what's most important. I think you really hit that like food on the table, or I'm going to go report this thing that happened to me. And we shouldn't have to be put in that position, but but we are right as a society being put in that position. I wanted to spend the last few minutes talking about. Um, what you all need in this moment and taking some time to reflect with each other. But before that, I've got a couple of questions um, that have come in from our Q&A. And uh, Angel, there's a couple of questions. Um, you know, we know that the, the Native American community was impacted just disproportionately early on, right, um, with, with COVID and, and the immense loss of life. Um, and, and a question about like, how are tribal communities supporting the recovery of COVID? And then we're also seeing that like the, the, um, the tribes are doing an, uh, an amazing job with vaccinating um, their communities and even offering, can you all still hear me? I just lost my video. <laughs> um, yeah, we can hear you. So I'm, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, uh, Angel, doing an amazing job um, with even offering vaccination um, to other community members. And so I wanted to see if you could talk about that briefly um, before we move into 
a reflection among you all. Well, I, I, it, it's really leaning into those values that you talked about in the very beginning, right? Like uh, when communities of color have very similar values, um, relationality, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, values around wealth, it's how much, how much you have, it's how much you give. Um, and so, so we come from communities that prioritize the health and well-being of our people, all of us that are up here right now. Um, and um, how tribes are leading the effort, well, they're still closed. Um, they're not reopening, the borders are still closed. I went home for my vaccination and I was greeted by a, you know, if you're a non-resident, you still need to stay out, that <laughs> you can go through the vaccination line. Um, and uh, just that, that they are, um, they are leading in vaccination um, for them and the surrounding areas. Um, yeah. I'm waiting for my video to come back up, but I can still hear all of you. So let's just keep going because we've got a few more minutes. I wanted to ask, you know, how this moment is affecting you all. And, you know, what do you need from, from your funders, from your board to sustain your leadership? Um, and so I wanted to spend some time um, in the last part of um, today's webinar talking about, you know, what, what do you need now? How's this moment affecting you now? Alicia, I can start with that. So in terms of funding, I think, um, you know, at least in Doniana, we've been very fortunate in the city of Las Cruces stepping in with a lot of funding effort. Uh, around the state as well, there's been a lot of other um, typically foundations that would not fund our work that have reached out to offer some funding. I think what's amiss though is a lot of this funding is related to COVID efforts. So I get a lot of people that call me and offer funding to sanitize and disinfect. And that's great, right? But there's only so much disinfection or sanitizing I can do, whereas the other needs still exist. So the needs that existed before still exist. And then there are new needs that, you know, again, we just talked about the systemic inequalities. So our people, the people that we're serving, they're suffering and they have certain needs that we're not having the funding to meet those needs. Um, so that's that's a big thing that at least that would help me. And I, I think that would help all of the all of my colleagues. In terms of the board of directors, I think just the we are in a pandemic, so it's not normal times. I think because that, that's something I wrestle with. It, it feels as if the demands are the same as they were always while we're still trying to navigate this pandemic, which is new to us also. I know we're leaders and we're expected to have the answers and to make the decisions, but we're also learning this as quickly as everyone else is and trying to make decisions that are best for everyone involved, you know, right in the minute, the same time that you're learning as well. So I think a little bit of understanding that, you know, we are in a pandemic. So all of us are, are working on this and to just have a little bit of patience. I think everything of prior to the pandemic really should take a back seat to what's actually going on right now. Um, we can go back to you know, whatever planning we were doing before the pandemic once it ends, but right now is not the time for that. So I think just that patience and support would be great. Thank you, Henry. Uh, I'm looking outside and I'm seeing a Comcast Xfinity truck in my yard. So I think my internet went out. <laughs> but I'm glad to be here on the phone still with you all. You know, um, Angel, when we were talking um, last week, you mentioned about taking a moment to reflect and, and honor the impact of this past year. And I wondered if you might want You went on mute when your camera came back on. Okay, here we go. I think I'm back. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> of course, this would happen now, right? Yeah, Angel, we're were all... you able to hear me? 
I, I, when we're talking about reflection, yeah, in the last year, and um, I definitely want to lift up something Henry said when we were getting prepared for this, which is so much has happened this past year, so much loss, um, the inability to, to prioritize time to grieve, um, we've been pivoting and pivoting, and just like we just did with you losing um, signal and sound, right? Pivoting and continuously moving on. Um, but how are we as leaders, leaders of community of color organizations prioritizing time to stop and rest and reflect and process um, a lot of what's happened, honor and celebrate a lot of the ways in which we've responded um, and just take heed of this past year. Um, we, I said it earlier, but we don't come from communities where this happened um, kind of somewhere else. It happened in our own organizations. It happened in our own families. Um, and I think it's important if for, for the resiliency, for all of these um, ways to keep us going, um, that we stop and, and reflect and have space and time with our organizations, with our board of directors um, to take heed about what happened. Um, and then if I could just jump in really quickly and answer that other question about like what we need from our boards and funders, because I need a list, <laughs> is yes. um, asking, asking everybody to go beyond land acknowledgements when it comes to indigenous issues, right? Like learn about the communities um, and the tribal people or on um, of which whose whose land you're on, there's a history there. Um, you know, if it if possible, somebody from both communities should be on your board of directors. Um, also, somebody on your board of directors for all of us should be um, from the communities that we serve. Um, and in saying that, you know, we should all be prioritizing alternative pathways to leadership within our organizations on our board of directors. Um, like westernized systems of education um, don't necessarily equate leadership for our communities. And then when it comes to philanthropy, we know that less than half a percent um, of those dollars make it to um, native organizations and less of that to native led organizations. So fund um, those, fund our organizations, right? And trust us um, to find the solutions to the violences that we face because we know those very intimately and deeply. Okay. Thank you, Angel. Johanna, do you wanna to add to that? Cause I know when we were talking last week as well, you were sharing some thoughts on, you know, what you all need from your funders, from your, your board and your staff in terms of supporting your leadership and the work that you all do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just going off what Angel said at the end, you know, the people closest to the pain are the people closest to the solution. And funders really need to take note of that in this moment, because a lot of us are, are saying, look, here, here is the need. We need things like cash assistance. We need to be fighting for um, some tr very transformative systemic changes. Things like in, in our unemployment law and who gets excluded. Um, you know, the new rescue plan has some really incredible things in it around childcare and like child subsidies that should stick around for frankly ever. And um, in order for us to do that kind of work, we need funding that matches, you know, those bold ideas that we have those bold solutions. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I've been very thankful in the last year that CAFE has received, you know, I've been awarded some rapid response grants, 10,000, 15,000, $20,000 here and there. I am deeply grateful for that, that. And at the end of the day, um, that's just simply not what we're sort of saying that we need. Um, and so I'm really, you know, hoping that um, foundations really begin to be um, better thought partners with us and conspirators with us about what our communities need. Um, and, uh, you know, we're totally willing to, you know, come to the table like that because, Frankly, our communities are, are in, in need of some bold action right now. Thank you so much. I know we are at 11 o'clock. That time went very quickly and my technical issues put me behind a little bit. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, maybe just some closing thoughts. I'm really grateful to all of you for your time this morning uh, sharing with us. Uh, I don't want to keep you all on too much longer beyond this time, but uh, if you just have some some closing thoughts that you want to share before we wrap up. Again, thank you to all uh, of the attendees today for dropping in your chats. Uh, 
for the questions that you posed. We really appreciate it. Again, you can always go to buildingmovementproject.org for more information on our work. Uh, super grateful to you all, grateful to our panelists. And if, if you all want to uh, share any, any last thoughts before we wrap up today, you're more than welcome. Mine is that we're not done with the pandemic. We're still in it. Wear your mask, get a vaccine when you can, um, and wash your hands, like all of the things. And, um, you know, we're going to come out of this stronger than before, for sure. Thank you, Angel. I agree. We're not, we're not done yet. And um, we need to keep taking care of each other. And you all are uh, amazing examples of that sort of leadership here in New Mexico. So we're very grateful for you. Sachi, Johanna, Angel, Henry. Go ahead, Johanna. I was just saying thank you all so much. Yeah, I was just going to say um, that, yeah, this was an incredible conversation and um, I loved hearing from my colleagues here and, and um, also that, you know, this just uplifting this again is that as leaders, as leaders of color, we hold a lot of trauma ourselves and so does so do our staff. And I think, um, you know, just recognizing that and, and being patient with ourselves and, and really finding ways like what Angel said to rest and reflect and um, acknowledge that we are holding so much on our shoulders and um, we're all, you know, we're super people doing this work. So um, yeah, just all of you all here who are attending and, um, and um, you know, leading other organizations and working with people on the ground, it's, it's incredible what we're doing and we're, we're surviving and thriving even though this is so hard. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's awesome. I, I'll close by saying, you know, thank you to you, Alicia, and the BMP team um, for hosting this. I think it's really important to have these conversations. Um, I, I learn from my, from my peers, from my colleagues, um, you know, your perspective, you know, teaches me and also gives me a sense of hope and purpose. So I think it's important, you know, what I'd like to say to all of our audience and, and all of you here with me, it's keep connecting. I know you know, it, it's not the same that we're used to because we'd rather be in person, having, you know, a tea, a coffee, a water, whatever that is, whatever your passion. But in connections, we, you know, there's kind of that sense of hope. So even in this, you know, this pandemic was probably the worst of us in many different ways. Um, but we still found a way to keep going forward. And here we are a year later as we started, and we're still here. And you know, we're doing the best that we can. And hopefully we're still here, you know, the year after that and the year after that. So again, connections are are very important. So don't lose sense of that because I think it's very easy today. We're all isolated in our homes. It's very easy to just disconnect. And I think that would be the worst thing we, any of us could actually do. Thank you for that, Henry. I think that's a, a really beautiful note to end on. Um, I, I'm very grateful again uh, to all of you for taking the time today to talk, uh, to, keep, to keep those connections, to keep the work going. Again, thank you to uh, my Building Movement Project team for all of your work, your insight, for these reports, for the studies, uh, for the continued work. Um, I'm very grateful to all of you. And we are over time, so I'm going to sign off. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Appreciate you. Have a beautiful and blessed day. Bye-bye.